I've entitled our study for today, The Unlikely Servant. Don't you think it's strange that God would refer to Nebuchadnezzar as my servant? That's because God looks into the future and can make a declaration. And he realizes that his plan is to draw Nebuchadnezzar to himself, the most unlikely of people. So uh, as I introduce this, I want to, uh, I'm, tr I'm trying to speak to you in a way that you can hear this. And so I'm referencing a doctrine of the Seventh-day Adventist Church as we look at this, the experience of salvation. In infinite love and mercy, God made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, so that in him we might be made the righteousness of God. This is directly from the 28 fundamental beliefs of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Led by the Holy Spirit, we sense our need, acknowledge our sinfulness, repent our transgressions, and exercise faith in Jesus as Savior and Lord. Subs, our substitute and our example. This saving faith comes through the divine power of the word and is the gift of God's grace. Through Christ, we are justified, adopted as God's sons and daughters, and delivered from the lordship of sin. Through the spirit, we are born again and sanctified. The spirit renews our minds writes God's law of love on our hearts, and we are given the power to live a holy life. Abiding in him, we are become partakers of the divine nature and have the assurance of salvation now and in the judgment when we take these steps out of love, we naturally obey God's law. This is God's purpose. He has called each of us to participate in fulfilling this purpose. The sad thing is that many Christians fail to see that people who are not like them are also called for God's purpose. This sermon will show you how the most unlikely of candidates can be transformed. Not this sermon, but this series. We're not, we won't get there through this sermon. But this series will show you how the most unlikely of candidates can be transformed to appreciate the power of God's love. My mission today is to lead us to open our hearts to a renewed mind so God's law of love may be written in our hearts, which gives us the power to live as written by the prophet Micah. He has shown you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to what? Do justly, to love and to walk All right, I'm, I'm going to have to say that out loud for the people watching online. <laughs> he has shown you, O oh man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. The events of Earth's history are ordered by the Lord. I say that in light of the upcoming Election. I'm not going to talk about politics. Because I don't want you to declare which candidate you are for. And we're not going to go there. <laughs> but in the light of the election, some on this side are saying the world is going to end if this candidate becomes president. And the people on the other side are saying the exact same thing. They both can't be right. 
Nothing ever catches God by surprise. By the way, if you, if you want to know who I'm voting for, you can ask me after church. Nothing ever catches him by surprise. Everything he orders demonstrates his love for mankind. He called Israel to be his people and placed them on a mission to show the world God's character. After receiving this call, after being delivered from 400 years of bondage in Egypt, after the miracles in the wilderness and ultimately entering into the rest of the promised land, it should be no surprise to consider Israel as a likely servant of God. There are countless stories in the Bible where men and women consider themselves unworthy of a calling from God. Every year in nominating committee, when we, uh, when we go through the process, uh, we ask people to serve, and they say, me? Now, not everyone is like that. They say, they say, oh, me? Oh, you shouldn't have asked me, knowing that they wanted to be asked. And then there are others who say, I can't do that. Uh, God has not called me. Uh, I don't have a spiritual gift. Be careful by declaring that you have no spiritual gift. For if you suggest that you don't have a spiritual gift, what you're telling me is you don't have the Holy Spirit. Because when we accept Jesus and we ac accept the Holy Spirit, uh, he infuses us with a gift. So stop telling people, you don't have a spiritual gift. You may say you don't know what it is. But if you've accepted Jesus, he has given us the gift of the Spirit. And with the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, he said he would send the Comforter. With that comes a spiritual gift. But there are countless individuals who said they were unworthy of a calling from God. Moses argued with God at the burning bush about his calling. He saw himself as an unlikely servant. When God instructed Samuel to visit Jesse's house to find the new king of Israel, it was the youngest who was chosen in the eyes of men. David was an unlikely servant. When they heard Jesus introducing the kingdom of heaven uh, to all of Galilee, many saw the carpenter's son as an unlikely servant. Today, as we begin this series on the conversion of arguably, arguably the most unlikely servants of all time, his name is Nebuchadnezzar. We could list many reasons why he would be considered an unlikely servant. Let's start with the fact that he was not a Hebrew. or he was not Seventh-day Adventist. In fact, he's the complete opposite of Hebrew. Not only did he not serve Jehovah, the only true God, he was a polytheist, which means he believed in many gods. His religion informed his understanding of military victories. He believed that a military victory proves whose God is greater. Uh, if you're into sports, like I am, I don't pray for my team to win. I was always confused by that. I don't think God is necessarily interested in who wins the game. Now, you know, he, he orders everything, so fine, but I'm not praying for my team to win because when I uh, argue against a Dallas Cowboy fan and if I took the same position as Nebuchadnezzar, if the Dallas Cowboy fan uh, served some other God and he's praying to his God that his team wins and I serve Jehovah and I'm praying to my God that my team wins, then whoever wins gets to declare whose God is greater. That's the way Nebuchadnezzar believed. He went to war 
First, he, he annihilated Egypt and he declared, my God is greater than the God of Egypt. And then he attacked Assyria and he declared, we won because my God is greater than the God of Assyria. Now he has Jerusalem under siege. In Jerusalem, there was a council of local leaders who wanted to resist Babylon's attack. Now, let me put a pin in that right there for a second. The part of this series that makes me sad, however, is that the resolution is incomplete. Meaning, as the story is told, all right, this is a spoiler alert. Spoiler alert is that Nebuchadnezzar is converted and he serves God in the end. We are not told anything else about him after his conversion. Nothing. Nada. Zilch. And so we don't see God's purpose in making sure that Nebuchadnezzar becomes a servant of God. The Bible does say his honor and splendor return to him and he experienced surpassing greatness. We will cross that bridge when we get there. For today, let's consider our text, Jeremiah 25, 8 through 11. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, because you have not heard my words, behold, I will send and take all families of the north, says the Lord. And Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant. How can he say that? Because God knows the end from the beginning. This is a prophecy. When Jeremiah says, this whole land shall be desolate and in an astonishment, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. This is a prophecy that predicts an economic downfall for Jerusalem and all of Judah. With this downfall, there will be destruction and desolation. The prediction is that this downfall will, re will remove the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness. That's why the psalmist says, uh, they're, they're challenged when, when they say, sing us the songs of Zion. And they say, how can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? There is agreement there in the word of God. And that's one of the things that excites me most about the word of God. It never disagrees with itself. There's no other literature known to mankind that does not agree with itself. That's the power of the word of God. I often disagree with myself on a daily basis. The voice of mirth and the voice of gladness removed. That means our children will not celebrate weddings People will not be working for their own economic gain and families will not gather around the lamp for, for meals. In other words, a level of misery is on the way. No one wants to be miserable. Well, there are some people who like being miserable. But too many people are miserable. But the word of God tells us that God helps us through our misery. When there came upon Israel the calamities that were the sure result of separation from God, subjugation by their enemies, cruelty and death, it is said his soul was grieved for the misery of Israel. In all their affliction, he was afflicted, and he bare them and carried them all the days of old. You'll find that in Judges chapter 10, verse 16, and Isaiah 63, 9. This puts to rest the notion that God is pleased when we suffer. There are people who believe that. There are people who think, oh, God has struck me down, and now he is, he's pleased because I am suffering. 
as if God is some tyrant waiting for us to fall so he can punish us. On the contrary, God is patient. God is long-suffering. He demonstrated this with the people of Israel. Within Jeremiah's message of doom, there was a message of hope. God is in control and he's leading Israel to submit to Babylonian authority in order to reach a greater end. First of all, Israel was not faithful. And God declared, if you're not faithful, as a natural result of your lack of faithfulness, bad things happen. Now, I personally don't believe that God punishes us for bad things. I think the choices we make create the bad circumstances for us, and then we in turn blame God. But juxtaposed to Jeremiah was a self-proclaimed prophet who opposed the messenger of God. Jeremiah illustrated God's will by preaching with a yoke around his neck. But they did not hear him. In fact, Hananiah, a self-proclaimed prophet of God, op opposed Jeremiah's message and demonstrated his opposition by taking the yoke from around his neck and throwing it on the ground and breaking it into pieces and then proceeded to declare God's message as, now he's speaking for God, thus saith the Lord, even so will I break the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, from the neck of all nations within the space of two full years. Can you imagine the minds and hearts of the people as they witness two men who claim to have a message from God standing on opposite ends of the issue? How would they choose which one to follow? In this series, I will show you how God will use unlikely circumstances to accomplish a greater purpose. Sometimes these purposes are not revealed to us. That is precisely why we must trust God through every situation. We can't know all that God knows. His strategy surpasses anything we could ever imagine. Jehovah is all powerful. With a word, he could flatten the entire Babylonian army, but the events of Earth's history are ordered by the Lord. How are the people to determine who's right? When making a choice, which way do you go? Do you follow the person whose message resonates with you? The choice in which you come out on top? Or do you follow the message you don't want to hear, even if it's the will of God? Nobody wanted to hear that they were going to be subjugated to Babylon. That was not a welcome message, but it was a message from God nonetheless. How can you submit yourself to a foreign polytheist? How can you stand by as this heathen ransacks the highest religious symbol uh, you've ever known, stealing the golden religious symbols from the temple? You've experienced this all your life. How can we stand by and let that happen? First, we must consider the whole message and use our own interpretation skills led by the Spirit. It appears to me that the people who rejected Jeremiah's message were doing so based on a theological point of view that was not their own. They took on the theological point of view of Nebuchadnezzar. You lost right there. Because Nebuchadnezzar's view is that if I win the battle, then that reduces Jehovah to a weak God compared to mine. And so the Israelites could not fathom that, but they were using a theological premise that was not biblical. How often 
Did the behavior of the Israelites cause them to be subjugated to the Philistines? How often, after 400 years of, of, of bondage to Egypt, there's no way that they could come to the conclusion that Egypt's God was greater than their God. It was all part of a greater plan. They were convinced that their God is all powerful and that they could defeat the enemy. They were not wrong about that. What they were wrong about was their understanding of how God operates. God is about to capture two birds with one trap, if I may use that analogy. He was going to address the sin of Judah and draw Nebuchadnezzar to himself. Ellen White says it this way. It was God's purpose that Jehoiakim should heed the counsels of Jeremiah and thus win favor in the eyes of Nebuchadnezzar and save himself much sorrow. The youthful, I have a slide for this so that you can follow along. Here we go. He's got it. It was God's purpose that Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, should heed the counsels of Jeremiah and thus win favor in the eyes of Nebuchadnezzar and save himself much sorrow. The youthful king had sworn allegiance to the Babylonian ruler and he had remained true to his promise, or had he remained true to his promise, he would have commanded the respect of the heathen and this would have led to precious opportunities for the conversion of souls. Ellen White is telling us that God had a plan to use this subjugation to create a relationship with Nebuchadnezzar. But by going against that plan, God had to use Daniel. She also says, the king of Babylon was to be the instrument of God's wrath on impenitent Judah. So here we have the most unlikely of servants, Nebuchadnezzar, a heathen king who served foreign gods, who also seen, saw himself as a god. He was impressed when, they, when his uh, military spies came and reported to him that there was a prophet predicting his victory. So much so that he told his general to bring Jeremiah to him. And he and Jeremiah started a relationship. God ordered this. He paved the way, the relationship between Jeremiah and Nebuchadnezzar paved the way for Daniel and his friends. And I want you to see throughout this series how God makes these subtle moves to draw the unlikely, most unlikely of servants to himself. That's his whole end goal. He wants to draw all men and women to himself. That's why he sent his son, to teach us the character of God through love and to merge this love with the commandments of God. When we watch and see how God uses Nebuchadnezzar to finally give way to, to Jehovah, we're not told more about what happens after he's converted, but I'm confident that many people saw the goodness of God through his conversion.
we're all called to be converted on a daily basis as we seek the Lord. And it's my prayer that we continue to grow in his grace and find that experience, find the strength in that experience to obey him out of love. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the word of God. We ask, Lord, that you would show us through the life and experience of Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar how you draw all men and women unto yourself miraculously. We thank you for that and we give you praise. Forgive us, Lord, for our sins and cleanse us from unrighteousness, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.